household textiles in the Viking Age, Scandinavia. Thank you. Please go. Yes. <laughs> so, as I said in the introduction, I think it's really important not just to talk about the tools or the textiles. You need to include a whole landscape when you discuss production on a certain site. The resources, as I said, technology and the textiles. And in the 90s, I did an investigation of seven late Iron Age Viking Age settlements in Scania. Five of them were considered as agra agra agrarian. There is one port of trade that is Odus on the, on the right here. And then a small village, and that is Lodeshatinge. Lodeshatinge is a very special place, and I will not go into that place uh, today. But I did record quite a lot of textile tools, and generally the majority of the textile tools, they were found in the pit houses. And I only recorded or I noted the tools coming from the floor layers, because we all know that there is a lot of tools and other things in the filling of the gourd. So altogether I studied 392 pit houses. There were textile tools in 202 of them. There was a high number of spindle whorls, and there were also quite a lot of loom weights in the uh, pit houses. And the results, they indicated a very production of different types of textiles on the agrarian sites and in the small village, except the very hard, fine qualities. They were only visible, this production was only visible in the port of trade in Aarhus. But the question is, how, how can we fill a house? How can we furnish a house with textiles? This is a reconstructed Trelleborg's house in the former Hoys Viking village in Sweden. How can we take all this one step further and discuss the consumption and fill the, our reconstructions with color, life and textiles? Haugen, he wrote uh, when he was discussing Oseberg, in the hall at Osebay, bedecked it for the banquet, we beheld a vivid contrast. On the benches, there were cushions made matching the assumption hangings on the lower walls, which was simply yet striking in appearance for the endless repeating pattern in a subtle check of the at least, at least three colors. But above the heads of the seated guests, there ran a banner with a frieze in vivid variety of powerful colors showing a fringe of adventures from the sagas and the myth. There is no textile archaeologist that would dare to write something like this today. <laughs> but what do we have today? What do we know about how they furnished a hall? Well, of course, we have something from the sagas. I sat with Tora seven half years, Håkon's daughter in Denmark. She embroidered in gold for my pleasure, southern halls and Danish swans. We also made pictures of the men's war play together and the warriors of the prince in our hand were handy work. And we have quite a lot of mentions of uh, tapestries in the sagas. Here is another one from Gisle Sjusons. Vestin, who had traveled to Denmark and England, brings home with him this valuable wall hanging. When the time comes to celebrate the autumn festival, to greet winter and make sacrifice to Freud, the people of Serbo Farm set to decorating the walls with tapestries and to spread hay on the floors. While this is going on, the desire to gain ownership of Westin's wall hanging grows and the intrigue begins. Mm -hmm. This will be continued. We also have early medieval texts describing different types of textiles. For example, we have refil or bordi or brun. And that is a border, or rather a long, narrow piece of cloth woven or em with woven or embroidered pictures. Uh, we have Bjor, that is a gable decoration, triangular, richly decorated <coughs> textile intended for the use for the gable of the house. We have Riglöken, and that is hangings placed above the benches fixed against the wall. Sutrik. And that is probably a linen cloth spread under the roof to protect against the falling sot. And then there is the name shald, and they think that this is a collective term of various types of covers. 
but also for the protective cloth that was used to cover the ship, ship when moored. And in Iceland, the word denoted a single whip fabric that runs the whole length of the church hall. So this is absolutely not a Viking hall. This is an old photo that shows simple house in the beginning of 1900. But here you can actually see some of those textiles. Up here you have the suktrip, uh, the linen cloth. Um, here you have the refill or uh, body. And here you have rivlakan. And please note that this is also decorated. It's decorated for Christmas. It's not something that you have up every day. It's special occasions when you use this. But what about the textiles themselves? Well, I would be very surprised if you haven't seen those uh, uh, tapestries before. Um, Oseberg, Norway, this is an old reconstruction. Marianne will give you all the information later in her presentation. Uh, and of course, we have the Bayeux tapestry dated to the end of the 11th century, which is 70 meter long and 50 centimeter high. Another very famous tapestry is uh, the other Hogdal, and that is dated now to uh, 1014 to 1170. And it is actually, you can only see four pieces here, but there are actually five pieces in these tapestries. Because when it was found in the beginning of 1900, 1910 to be exact, it looked like this. The tapestries, they were actually sewn, they were joined together. But what is interesting is that they were joined together in the 14th century. And that is a couple of hundred years after they were produced, showing us how long time you can have a textile if you keep it if you preserve it well. Uh, and there is another fantastic that I would like to show with you. And this is the oriental marble carpet. It has a border, if you see up. That is a technique that is called the double weave. It's dated to 980 to 1160. The carpet is made in Turkey. We don't know how it came here. But I think it's made in Turkey, and it's dated to the 14th to the 15th century. But what is even more fantastic is that the sewing thread is dated to the 19th century. So in the 19th century, someone sewed those parts together. And this also demonstrates how valuable the textiles are when they are preserved in nearly So we do have the Tsumak technique, but we also have other techniques and textiles dated back not only to the early medieval, but also to, to the Viking Age. Here are some examples. First, you see uh, a Kongressen church dated to 780, 980. It has only a width of 15 centimeters, but it's several meters long. Uh, there is a part of Överhovdal that is not sumac, but it's also a double weave. It's 176 centimeters long and 26 to 30 centimeters wide. And then we have the piece from Marble Church, 980 to 1160, and it's only 17 centimeters. But we also have much wider textiles, and I do apologize for not having a scale on this, but this is actually a quite big textile. And this dates back to 990 to 1160, and this is a cover. It's also a double weave. And first you just see the geometric, you know, geometrical patterns, but when you start to look very careful, you can, for example, you can see, I don't know if it's a chicken, in the middle up you can see your ship. So there is full of decorative elements in also those double weaves. Besides all the weaves that we have, we also have embroidery. And I'm fully assured, I, I know that some of those embroideries, they are dated to the medieval period, they are Christian. But all those different sewing techniques we have also found from the Viking Age or from previous periods. The textiles, they were kept, and they were kept in chests. Here is one example that could have, you could have had textiles in from Oseberg. Uh, but there is also example 
To the left, you see a stonda. And again, I have to apologize for not having a scale on it, but this is actually quite used. It's something like this. It's high. Uh, they have said they have been interpreted also to being used for baptizing. But there are some scholars that says that this could also be used to keep the, the, the textiles in them. Um, and also for dowry, something that we also need to include in our discussion. Okay, we continue with Gisle Sursson saga. So, the hangings. Um, now when Thurgrim and his men were busy putting up the hangings in the hall, Thurgrim all at once said to Torkel, those hangings would become in well, those fine ones, I mean, that Vestin wished to give thee. Methinks there is a great difference between you having them for a day or having them all together. Um, so I wish those would send for them now. So he sends a man to Gisli's house, where Gisli and his wife Ord were working hard to putting up the hangings. And German told his errand and the whole story. Well, Ord, said Gisli, will you lend them the hangings? Why ask me at all, says Ord, when thou knowest that I would neither grant them this or not aught else that would do them any honor. So she didn't want to lend him the hangings. And this was the start of a very bloody fight in the Viking Age. So this was just to give you an idea about other types of textiles and not just the textiles used for clothing. And I think that it is important not just to discuss the solely household own needs. Uh, I think we also need to discuss these types of textiles uh, that also requires maybe some special knowledge and skills, and maybe also that they used raw materials of better or higher quality, for example, imported silk, but also something that they did not in that they didn't work with full time. So I think it's important again to include all the different sources that we have, to include the landscape of the textile production, and then maybe there is some archaeologist, that, textile archaeologist, that in the end could write something that the, in the wall hangings woven scenes that attracted and held the eyes and the, uh, on the eyes attention, that we can dare to make the halls come alive and furnish the houses. So thank you for your attention.